These are my twin cousins. Even though I've known them for my whole life, I still confuse them sometimes. Well, for me, this doesn't have any consequences, or at least I hope it doesn't. There are other circumstances in which being unable to identify which, which twin is which can have very severe implications. Take, for example, this one case of a rape that happened in 1999 in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Prosecutors on this case were able to identify a suspect using DNA sampling. However, they encountered a challenge that led the case to be hampered and unsolvable for over 20 years. Their identified suspect had an identical twin. And D standard DNA tests can't identify between identical twins. This caused a very critical legal dilemma. Imagine you were given two suspects as similar as my identical twin cousins. How would you know which of the two twins committed a crime if neither of them confessed? If you were in the shoes of a prosecutor, how would you act? Would you convict both twins knowing that one of them is innocent? Would you let both twins walk free knowing that you've released a criminal? Would you take your chances and choose one of the two twins to convict, risking that you've made the wrong choice? Aside from the ethical dilemma that this rises, another question arises when considering, when deeming one twin guilty and not the other. What were the motives that led only one of the two identical twins to commit the crime? Given that they have the same genetic makeup and were raised in virtually the same environment, would it be likely to predict that the other twin could have been just as likely to commit the crime as well? This leads me into one of the most discussed dichotomies in criminology, the nature-nurture debate, asking the fundamental question of what drives people to act criminally, their nature or nurture? In search of an answer, psychologists have looked to isolate the effects of nature and nurture on criminal behavior and how they develop in people. And this is where twins come in. The same, uh, the same quality of 100% shared DNA in identical twins, which is a challenge for forensic dispute, is actually the quality that enables this variable isolation through studies of twins that were raised apart. The observable differences in their behavior can be solely attributed to their upbringing and can therefore categorize traits into mostly environmentally influenced and mostly genetically influenced. Through using these studies, uh, traits such as depression and political views have been shown to be more environmentally influenced. However, there are traits that are more genetically influenced and among those are criminal tendencies. Now this might actually sound kind of scary, thinking that even if you grew up in a constructive environment, an ancestor that might have a criminal record might influence you to be more inclined to commit a crime in the future. However, this conclusion excludes one of the most uh, influential aspects of what causes your genes to be expressed in your behavior, and that is epigenetics. Epigenetics literally translates to on top of your genes and refers to a set of instructions or marks that accumulate on top of your DNA and change the way in which your genes are influenced over time and the way that they're expressed in your behavior. Take, for example, this one cell that starts out with one set of epigenetic marks. When it starts to split, each of its daughter cells starts to accumulate its own unique set of these marks, therefore causing each of your cells to be different, even in the slightest. Now think of identical twins that start out as one embryo. When they split, each twin begins to develop their own set of epigenetic marks, thus making them slightly different from one another. This has had revolutionary effects on cases such as the one in Michigan, and, the, and caused the development of forensic testing that looked at the epigenetic sequence instead of the genetic one, and can therefore identify which twin is which, even if the twins are identical. However, the power of epigenetics can apply to everyone, even if they're not an identical twin. And this can also explain why one twin ends up as a criminal and the other remains innocent. When I started to think about this, I saw the changes in, the, of, in my own family. My twin cousins got drafted to the army about a month ago. Approximately a week before that, my family went to visit them in Haifa. It didn't take more than five minutes until their dad made a joke that if they didn't like their different units, they could just switch places. And at that point, I realized that it never crossed my mind that my identical twin cousins could be drafted into different units. And I found out that it wasn't only that that was different, but they also received different profiles altogether. You see, before drafting to the Israeli army, you get tested with psychometric tests, and, uh, and you get a score based on that and your education level. I, and you probably, would assume that identical twins that grew up going to the same school would receive approximately the same scores. However, in my family, that wasn't the case. One of the twins received a score that was high enough for her to pursue an officer position, whereas the other scored slightly below the national average. Surprisingly enough, the twin that scored highly also told us about the dance classes that she started taking and the healthy diet that she's been adopting in the months preceding her army tests, whereas the other 
posted about the parties that you would go to every weekend. Now at this point, you're probably asking yourself, how can I end up like the first twin? And, <laughs> and the answer to that lies in epigenetics and applies to everybody, even if you're not my identical twin cousins. You see, the epigenetic marks that accumulate over our DNA over time can actually influence if our gene, which of our genes are expressed and can encourage the expression of positive traits or suppress that of negative ones. And this, taking this into consideration um, with criminal behavior can actually be very encouraging, thinking that even if, for example, a person has parents with a criminal record, they can actually use epigenetics in order to suppress those traits and become inherently less violent. And the best part is about this, that we are at large in control of our epigenetic marks through the, through the things that we choose to eat, whether we choose to exercise, how much alcohol we consume, or how many hours of sleep we get at night. We don't yet know whether there are specific lifestyle changes that can elicit specific epigenetic responses. However, we do know about the benefits of le leading a balanced and healthy lifestyle, and now these benefits may extend further than just feeling good. This has actually been studied in various prisons in which groups of prisoners were split into two sections, one which was given a nutritional supplement and the other a placebo, in order to test whether a nutritional balance would cause people to behave less criminally. Whereas the placebo group showed no difference in their propensity to offend, the group that received the nutritional supplement showed a staggering 26% decrease in their uh, tendencies to behave criminally. And these changes started to show as early as two weeks into the two-year experiment and were significant beyond the 95% level. This not only shows that it is, it is able for people to inherently become less criminal through, uh, through changing their lifestyle factors, but also for, peop for people who have also committed crimes in their past to reverse these effects in their behavior. The power of epigenetics extends beyond just identical twins and beyond prisoners as well, or the influence that we have over our own genetics. As these influences could be passed down to our children through the genetic material that we pass down to them. And therefore, the positive accumulation that we, do, that we make in our genetics can be passed down to future generations. What I'm really trying to say is, what you ate for lunch today can actually impact global crime rates in 50 years. <laughs> the things that you choose to eat, whether you choose to exercise, smoke, or drink alcohol, can actually determine the identities of the next criminal generation. I challenge you, and myself as well, to take one step towards leading a healthier lifestyle and doing a favor not only to ourselves, but also to the generations that follow us. And with that, I rest my case. Thank you.